and it feels like. Got it. Okay. Anyway, good afternoon. Good evening. I, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm Cheryl Neeser. I am a coach, um, Scrum Master with Improving, and I really want to say thank you to everyone who has come to, to the meetup today, those that are brand new uh, members of our community and those that are um, returning and continuing to return. So um, really, I'll buzz through introductions and some of the things that I, I usually you know, share with people at the beginning of a meetup. We've got a uh, leadership team, Julie Rue from Royal Bank of Canada, Chris Wickett with Improving, Cheryl Anderson, C Prime, Craig Schumann with Orfeo um, Consulting and Turnberry Solutions, Angela Agresto, um, who's with uh, Agresto Consulting and Training, Marilyn Lang, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota, and a member at large, um, Mark Strange, and he is with Lucid, and he also does work with Improving, which is how I met him. So our, our mission for a Minnesota Agile community is really centered around community and being Agile. So we welcome all of you practitioners, any background to, to learn and grow together with us to, to advance our skills and to share our knowledge um, as a community. So really appreciate the time that you're spending with us because we know you have a lot of choices. There are so many things globally that are available to you. So it's, it's really, um, we can't really share how, how much gratitude we have for you that you are spending time with us as a community and, and helping us um, continue to grow and share. Um, please do, you know, let us know, you know, what events and topics you'd be interested in. And, um, you know, just, just remember that we're trying to, you know, go beyond those basic um, principles and, and ideas around framework and, and really focus um, on people being agile in the mindset. Um, so a few things before I kick off with our presenter today. Um, this is our first year anniversary. Last January, we launched this community with a, a wonderful Esther Derby presentation. And we have continued every month having this like really outstanding, I think, stellar um, either panels or presenters. And tonight and what we have planned from now through um, May just continues with, with um, I, what we think are, are truly extraordinary opportunities for us to discuss and, and continue to, to learn and share as a community. So um, as part of this anniversary celebration, we're gonna be giving a few giveaways. And um, so, you know, probably take down everybody who's attending and then do a random drawing and then um, connect with each of you that has won one of our, our little um, branded items, which is going to be a, a journal with uh, our logo on it, and um, then get that sent out to you. So I just wanted to share that in advance. Um, and then also tonight, which is particularly um, fun for us as well, is we are um, sharing our session with uh, Women in Agile, Twin Cities, of which Sharon Auerbach is a host of that, um, that group. And so I would like her to just um, share a little bit more. Many of you know Sharon from previous meetups that we've had or meetups that she you know, runs herself, um, Women in Agile or Agile Book Club, things like that. But um, she's always been a frequent presence here. We really, she's a wonderful collaborator. We appreciate that she reached out to us to um, spend some time with our group and bring in Women in Agile as well. And so um, we're hoping as well that in the future, we can we can share another joint topic. So, Sharon, anything you want to say? A couple sentences. Off mute, maybe. <laughs> it's oh, been are. over two years, and this is still my problem. But thank you, thank you, Cheryl, <laughs> and thank you to everyone who signed up um, through Women in Agile Twin Cities. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with the group, um, our, we're a local group of international. Uh, of, of an international nonprofit organization uh, that's called Women in Agile. It's worldwide. Um, and our mission for our local group is to empower, connect, promote, and support the work of outstanding women in the Agile community to create more diversity and inclusion of ideas. And we believe that everyone is better off 
when more ideas are shared and people of all genders are welcome to join us. So please do join us if that's of interest to you and I will put a link in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. All right, I'd also like to share real quickly before we move on and, and I introduce Polly, is that next month on the 17th of February, we will be hosting Michael Wallace. Mike is a consultant with Improving from the Ohio office, and he is a scrum.org trainer. And Michael will be sharing evidence-based management with us. So we really hope that you'll join us next month. Um, so I do want to introduce our guest presenter. Holly Skaya, I'm like really happy um, to have this opportunity to introduce her. You know, we first met um, several years ago, probably maybe three, four, somewhere four maybe. Um, I think it's been a while, but we were both working for the same uh, client a few years ago. Uh, working with her was such a great opportunity, particularly for me, as well as the client um, in, in terms of you know, we were training teams, we were working at Lunch and Learns, and um, we were together on a team of coaches. So it was really great working with her for a little, yeah, it was probably about a year, a little, maybe a little bit more than a year that we worked together. But for me, that was unfortunately too short, because from my perspective, I have been so fortunate to work with her to see how she facilitates, to see how she trains, to see how she engages people is, is it's like, it's fabulous. And what I think is really cool as well is she's inspiring. She shares stories. And I would, I would say, you know, I follow her now on social media and there's always something really fascinating about the things that she shares. She's very human. She's very warm. It could be a picture of a dog or her grandchildren or her children, or just those things that kind of lift you up. And, and so I, I, I would really recommend, you know, connect with her, follow her on LinkedIn because she's amazing. Um, she also, as she mentioned in the speaker bio, she's like, she lives in brief agile. You know, she calls herself a mindset muse and she has an agile mindset and agile mindset. And that was before it became a thing. So um, I, I, I remember we, one of the lunch and learns that we did was really on mindset. And that still sticks with me because it was really fun. <laughs> it was a really fun uh, lunch and learn. And um, it's just one of many things. She's, like I mentioned, outstanding facilitator, outstanding trainer. So please do connect with her. She's a project manager. I love the story. And I was trying to find the exact verbiage of it because I couldn't figure out if it was Facebook or if it was LinkedIn. But the fact that she, at a very, very young age, was one of those people that could talk to anyone and that would talk to them about, uh, say, a particular problem that they were trying to solve and listen and, and really help them find, you know, what is a potential solution for my problem? And as a young child, I think that's really special. So... Anyway, she uses these tactics today to support teams and, and to train and, and to help people grow. She's a great enterprise agile coach. She, what I found out is like, well, how do you know this person? Um, and she's like, well, I work with him at blah, 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 you know, and a BP. And so she knows common people at Improving too, which is like, it's a small world. And I was so glad when I, I said, you know, I'm going to ask Polly if she'll present. And very, very grateful that she said yes, that she would present. So with that, um, I just want to turn it over to Polly. I say thank you. <laughs> You're so sweet. I'm like, oh, I'm just blushing. Thank you. Um, watch out. Cheryl will stalk you on social media and reveal all your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. And I love, there's so many faces on here that I'm like, oh, I know these people. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And we're going to have some fun. We're going to do some breakouts and you're not going to hear a whole lot from me. I have posted and I'll, I'll post it again here in the chat. Um, we've got a mural board set up. So I'd love for everybody to just go to the mural board, please. And um, while you're getting there, we've got a check-in. Okay, so I'm going to bring you guys to me. And I want you to just put one thing you're looking forward to in 2022. This is a little bit so that we can see who's here today, but also so we can learn a 
what are you excited about for this new year? What has you jazzed? What are you looking forward to? And while you're doing that, I put mine out there. I haven't had a technology-free vacation in about 15 years. And in two weeks, we are flying to Disney World. So my husband and I have a blended family of seven children. We have two grandchildren. We stay very busy. And we are going to Disney World for a whole week, technology-free, except for our iPhones. So I'm looking very forward to that. And so as we go back to our board here, learning better ways to help others. In-person classes, nice. Yeah, they're coming back. Very cool. Traveling to another country. What do we got here? Warmer weather and walks. Yes, yes, indeed. So while you're putting your goodies up there on what are you looking forward to in 2022, today we're here to talk about miscommunication. And as we're looking forward to the year, I want you to also reflect a little bit on what are some of those things that have happened in the past that you would like to improve upon this year around your communication? So think about some of those teams that you've worked with, some of the leaders perhaps, or organizations, or maybe it's even just something that happened in a retail store or at a restaurant and, and you had poor service. So I want you to just think about those and next in line for a car, one year from, oh, I hope it's a fun car. All right, and as everybody is filling those in, I'm going to take you to the next section, which is having you guys now identify what are some causes of miscommunication. And go ahead and write all your ideas up there. What are some of the reasons? And I'm going to put the timer for two minutes. And then, uh, then we'll look at what are some of the reasons? What are some of the challenges you're having? Hi, Val. Good to see you. And I'll post the link. One more time, not enough information. Yes. Can we get to how to do that? All right, not listening, not having an open mind. I'm gonna make this, make some of these a little bit bigger. Yeah, not listening. Whoops. Lack of context. Assuming before listening, yes. Listening to respond, not understand. Fear, fear is huge. Hi, Polly, this is Scrum Master Sanjay. I just wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. Uh, there's a few of us that can't get on to mural for some reason, and I then at least we could see. I would love to, Sanjay. Great to hear your voice. Awesome. All right. So a lot around listening, right? We got a lot of challenges that writing memos in a rush, not taking time to confirm. Yeah, we need shared understanding. Very good. Very good. You guys get it. So part of what we deal with when we're, when we have misunderstandings is that lack of emotional intelligence or lack of awareness, what's really going on? So many of you are familiar with Daniel Goleman's book, Emotional Intelligence, written quite some time ago. And he really focuses on the five skills to enable the emotional intelligence and build upon. So we have self-awareness, self-regulation, empathy, motivation, and social skills. And then, a little bit later, Travis Bradbury and Jean Greaves created Emotional Intelligence 
I love this book. In the back of it, there's a little test that you can take, see where you are in your EQ right now. And then a few months later, and it gives you tips and techniques on how to improve in different areas. Then a few months later, you can take the test again to see how you've grown and to see areas that you could continue to improve upon. So I love that book. I've done it a gazillion times. When COVID started and we had two college age students living with us full time again, we actually sat down every night and worked on our EQ together to create working agreements. How are we going to live together now? Because we haven't lived like this for a while. So um, we really built on self-awareness and the self-management, social awareness and relationship management. That's the focus in the EQ book. And Self-awareness and self-management lead to self-improvement. So when you're aware of what's going on within yourself and how you're handling situations and you're aware of your triggers, you learn how to manage those outcomes and those responses, and then you can work on improving. Also, when you have your self-awareness, then you can engage in social interactions more, more uh, fluidly. That's your social awareness. That improved social awareness leads to relationship management, and that can lead to team improvement. That can help you with your work relationships, your personal relationships, your any family improvement, whatever you want to call it. So ultimately, they play back and forth, and they all lead to continuous growth and improvement. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to break you guys into 11 breakout rooms. This is a networking opportunity as much as it's um, a learning opportunity. And so we want to have small enough groups so that you're able to connect with each other while having um, everything covered and a little bit of fun. So I'm going to show you what the board looks like here. And you're going to go across. So room number one, you're going to have self-awareness, and you're going to focus on Gary, Go Gary Go um, Goldman's area in the green here. So room number one will be self-awareness, room number two, self-regulation, three, empathy, room four will be motivation, room five will be social skills. And then we'll go down. So if you're in room six, go down to the blue area, and six through 11, you're going to be in the blue area. What each of you are going to do in this room is you're going to talk, introduce yourselves, spend a little time getting to know each other. And then I want you to talk about what does this mean to you? So what does self-awareness mean to you? When does self-awareness matter? And what are some tips and tricks you can use to improve it? Okay, so just answering these three questions. Each topic, same thing. And identify who in your group is going to speak on behalf of your party and share and educate the rest of us on your topic. Same down here. We're going to focus on the emotional intelligence 2.0 realm. So we've got self-awareness, self-management, self-performance or self-improvement. And then we've got social awareness, relationship management, and team performance or team improvement. And so I want you to get together introduce yourselves to each other, and then answer the questions, choose a spokesperson. And I want you to do that all in five minutes. So I'm gonna set a timer. And Cheryl, let me know when you're ready with the 11 breakout rooms. Yep, all ready. Awesome. Hit the button now. Perfect. See you guys in five-ish minutes. I still see screen, do we have everybody back? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. All right. How was that for you guys? Besides the time went quick. Just time. <laughs> That's always the case, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right. So I am going to share and who wants to share with us this first group on self-awareness? Who wants to speak just quickly, a little bit of an overview on self-awareness? I'm muted. There you go. I'm talking away. Um, so this is Craig and uh, we're in group one here. We got through introductions and then we started to talk about number one, what does it mean? 
you know, so we just kind of popped in there around, you know, what, what does it mean? And so that's all we got through is really, you know, being able to focus on yourself and how your actions, thoughts, or emotions do or don't align with your internal standards. <clears throat> Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. And I think just getting through this, what does it mean, will allow people to start to think about when does it matter? Like self-awareness, probably ongoing, right? Yeah. Difficult conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we can think about how can we improve? So if we know it's our awareness, then maybe what are things that we can do? Nay, did you have something to share? Uh, somewhat. As far as uh, what does it mean? I wouldn't put everyone in the same classification. Who I'm speaking to, if they're really important and I need to um, get answers or whatever I need, yes, it is. It does mean a lot. But if it's some stranger, or not, not interested in this person. It, it really doesn't matter what I'm going to say because I'll never see him again. Chances are, if they understand me, probably don't. <laughs> no, I think I, I think I do get it. Um, I did. What does it mean? It, it, the self awareness is being aware. What, what I think you're saying is mm -hmm. being aware of the moment mm -hmm. and how to focus on. Um, articulating properly in the right situation, right? Mm -hmm. And when to walk away, mm -hmm. yeah. when to hang up the phone, things like go. that. Yeah, it's it's difficult, um, really, really more so the day and age with the virus and whatever to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. So then when we move on to self-regulation, so who would like to, sh who's from this group? That would be me. I'm sharing on behalf of group two. Um, yeah, so we had self-regulation and for what does that mean? It is kind of having that ability to manage your emotions and behavior based on the situation. Um, and then something that really matters all of the time and, and just improving it by practicing and, you know, it's all you can do, practice and get better. Great call out. I love it. That's perfect. Thank you, Cassidy. Who's got empathy? That will be our group. Awesome. Um, we kind of, we didn't really get towards um, what it actually means as a collectively as a group. Um, <laughs> we were kind of talking about our um, introductions, but I see some great things that we put in here, like to care for people, um, trying to really understand um, from that person's perspective, understand and share the feelings of others, which is always important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's walking in their shoes or trying, right? Nobody can be in that situation exactly the same. But if we can try to understand what they're going through, we can get a different perspective. One of the activities that I share with folks a lot is a, a thing I call perspectives where you try to, you know, I'm, I'm having a disconnect with someone. I try to put myself in their shoes. What's their perspective? Why did they say this? Why are they acting that way? And then I try to look at it, you know, what if someone was walking by and saw that engagement that we had, what would they be thinking? And try to see it from like, if a bird was flying by or if my dog was walking by and they'd be like, what are you doing? And just really trying to see it from a multitude of perspectives allows us to connect better in the moment. Good stuff. Anything else you'd like to share about this? All right, well done. Motivation. I've got that one, Polly. Um, what does it mean? Uh, having that drive to see things through, to deliver that uh, product increment uh, when does it matter? Uh, throughout the sprint, particularly during those difficult times, mm -hmm. those moments where the challenges are, are high, and then how can you improve it? Find the motivation triggers of the team members, uh, which is not only in a group sense, but also as a, on a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people get motivated by the work and not the 
bureaucracy or the red tape. Otherwise, other people want, want to see statistics and metrics and such. So different variety of situations that can motivate people. Nice. Great call out, Aaron. Okay, so who was in the social skills group that would like to share with us what you came up with? Hey, Polly, that would that would be me. Um, so we talked about the fact that social skills are the skills that we use every day to interact verbal non and nonverbal both. Uh, so facial expressions, body language, etc. Uh, what when does it matter? It always matters. I think that our body language and our facial expressions really help um, the other person be able to understand what it is we're trying to say, as well as being able to kind of share additional communication points that we're not actually sharing verbally. Um, so they're both readable. And we did not get to how can you improve it? We ran out of time. Yes. But I think one through four, uh, all are ways in which we can work on improving Nice, nice. And this is just, I know it's not detailed. Many of you have taken classes on this stuff or built your skills. Um, the self-awareness here, I don't know if anybody from this team had anything extra to share, but this is just an overview to remind us because these emotional intelligence skills are cornerstone to helping us have better in engagements with people and with teams. And especially since all the pandemic and all the working from home, people have kind of forgotten how it is to relate to others. That's really obvious if you drive on the freeways at all. People don't even pay attention. They don't use blinkers. They stop signs are optional. It's crazy. And it negatively impacts the people around. So really just kind of going back to the basics here is all we're just touching on it cursory. So something that someone told me years ago that stuck with me uh, is perception is reality. <laughs> and what they were trying to say is, right, you have your own perception of how you're coming across, but that's probably not reality. Others' perception of how you are coming across is actually reality. Uh, and so understanding that, I think that I think ties into self-awareness that uh, like kind of almost like jumping out of your skin and how am I being perceived? How are they are, you know, interpreting what I'm saying or acting or doing? Mm -hmm. And that's part of being self-aware. Indeed. Great call out, Jamie. Thank you. Awesome. Val, you were the one in self-management. Do you want to just give an overview to the group and what wrap this Neatly in a bow. Can you hear me? I, I was on mute. Yep, can That's hear okay. you. So basically, we uh, talked about uh, self management in a lot of different areas. Uh, self care. Um, before you can give care, you need to take care of yourself. When do you need a break? We talked about um, also. Um, knowing what your triggers are, using yourself, managing yourself with your triggers. And um, for me, my contribution, we had a lot, each of us gave a contribution. My contribution was, I think self-management um, is about setting your own priorities and not giving your power to someone else. You're empowered. You decide what the priorities are and where you're going to add the most value or where you're going to receive the most value. Great call and, and I added what we resist persists to this trigger piece. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but sometimes when something triggers us and we try to run away, we try to push, we try to avoid, it keeps coming up. And I use that as something I need to be aware of so that I can work through it so it no longer bothers me or so I know how to handle it better or am wiser about removing myself from a situation. Yeah. yeah. Love it. All right, I'm gonna mess these up so that I can bring this stuff up because we've got, all right, self-performance. Who's got self-performance, self-improvement? Yeah, I think that was our group. Um, and on the first one we talked about, well, we didn't have a, we had like a minute to do all three of them. So we kind of yep. rushed through because we spent uh, more time getting to know each other, which was fun. Which is awesome. Uh, 
said, what does it mean? It's like how you carry yourself. Uh, it matters. Where does it matter? It matters at work, um, and how you're performing and playing well with others, that type of thing. And then how can you improve it? So we talked about um, you just need to get some new tools, uh, eliminate unnecessary low volume activities and delegate. Love it. Nice. And I love that you guys called out the delegate. You don't have to do it by yourself. We're working more and more in teams and having that awareness of what you can and can't do, huge. Thank you. How about social awareness? Who's on that team that would like to share social awareness? Yeah, that's me. Uh, me and Chad uh, talked about this. We felt like social awareness was really kind of being able to read the room, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What's the temperature of the audience and being able to understand how you fit into that society or that you know, specific group. Um, you know, this is this can be an important skill in, you know, when you're facilitating um, large meetings like you're doing right now, Polly, um, you know, sharing information and discussion with people, right? You kind of, again, kind of read the room, read the faces, and then, you know, certainly, right, how we drive towards the goal, right? So being able to slow down or speed up, um, you know, based upon those things. And then, you know, how do we improve those uh, through practice, you know, bringing it to light, right? Not, you know, as you said, what persists or what resists persists. So, you know, if we're not aware of it and, 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 you know, bringing light to it, like, hey, guys, I'm noticing, you know, from your reactions that, you know, maybe we aren't all on the same page, right? Mm -hmm. And that we're asking for feedback. So um, those are some thoughts we had on it. Love it. Love it. Reading the room is not an, an easy, natural skill for a lot of people. It does take practice, practice, practice. And I love this asking for feedback because people are afraid because they don't want to hear what other people think, but it really can help us improve. And if we look at it, not as good or bad, but just as um, thoughtful sharing, I think it, it helps us so much more. Great call out. Thank you. Who has relationship management? Hi. Uh, oh. no, if you want to, that's fine. Otherwise I can. Go, go, Brad. <laughs> uh, so we actually didn't really get to our introductions. We just kind of jumped right into it. Um, we all kind of had mixed feelings because each of us have different ideas of relationship management, uh, whether that is the organization view, vendors, audience, clients, collaboration. Uh, the idea is fostering growth between your, yourself, your audience, trying to understand them. Uh, we were in unanimous agreement that it matters all the time. There's not a time it doesn't. Yeah. Um, you know, how to improve it, uh, continual growth, branch out, seek understanding, uh, try to see from other people's perspectives if they're giving pushback or why that they're acting a certain way, try to understand them. Great call out. And I love this. It does. It depends on who you're engaging with. And this goes back to what Nay said in the beginning, where we really need to be aware of our presence, who we're with, how we engage. Um, a story that I share with Sarah, who I've known for several years, might be, I might share it with her a, in a different way than someone that I just met today, you know, and, and I might share a story with my husband in a different way than I would share with my children. So understanding that relationship and where things are and the outcomes are really important. And relationship management's at home, it's at work, it's when you're out in public, love that. All right, bring us home, team group. All right, um, that'd be me. And of course, we didn't have a lot of time. Uh, the time flew by so quickly that um, we didn't even get a chance to scratch the surface. But um, the meaning of what does team performance mean is how they're doing, do they work well together? Um, it's also uh, communication and in information sharing, a shared understanding, and it, it, predictability. How predictable is the performance? That missing? When does it matter? Always. And then finally, for the third one, how can we improvement, uh, improve it? This was kind of just throwing things on the wall in the last 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So uh, retrospective team activities, uh, giving feedback and um, team building exercises. 
Perfect. I love it. And, and as you saw, everything builds upon itself. And so when you get to this team level, if you have improved individual understanding, then your teams, each person cares about what they're doing, cares about that engagement with each other, your teams are going to start performing at a higher level. It is crazy how few people actually understand how they impact others. And that could be speaking up, or that can be silence when we want them to talk. Right, so it's really important that we help our teams grow. Now, active listening is our next bit. And Stephen Covey, I'm gonna share my screen here quick. Stephen Covey wrote that great little book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in this book, he talked about five listening skills, five listening levels, ignoring, we know what that's like. Pretending to listen. Have you ever tried to tell a story to someone or ask someone a question and they're reading or they're on the computer or they're playing a game and they act like they understood what you said and might say, oh yeah, mm hmm And then later you ask the question and they're like, uh, oops happens in meetings all the time. People are multitasking. And so understanding, are they ignoring you? Are they pretending to listen? Then we go into selective listening, that level one listening where it's kind of like an order taker. You're sitting there listening to someone, trying to predict what they're gonna say next so that you can respond or waiting for them to take a breath so that you can share your thoughts. Then we have that attentive listening, you're actively listening, you're engaged in the conversation and it's a back and forth give and take. And lastly, we have empathic. And that's where you get into a groove with someone and you got such a tight connection that you're, you're really almost able to read each other's minds. Or, you know, let's say I'm in a session with Angie and we're doing some coaching to help on the team. And she's asking some questions and I've been there, I've done that. And I'll ask her something to see if she's considered this. And then we'll start another level of a conversation which may go into another direction. And it's really being there and being in the moment with the person and that ebb and flow. It doesn't happen all the time. It would exhaust you if it did because you don't wanna always be feeling what's going on for the other person. You need to have a little bit of a disconnect, but you wanna be there with them in the moment so that you can have rich, meaningful conversations. All right, any questions about the five things I just shared? So we identified in the beginning, miscommunication often has to do with not listening. So what I'm going to do is we're going to break you guys into five breakout rooms. And you're going to introduce yourselves to each other quickly. And through conversation, you're going to get to know each other a little better. So I'm going to have you self organize and how many people we've got 44 people and divided by five. So we'll have about eight, nine people in a room. And what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself and then we're gonna practice each level of listening. So the first level, ignoring, we're going to, one person's gonna be the speaker, one person's gonna be the listener, everybody else is gonna observe what's going on. Okay, so if Cassidy's telling me a story and I'm ignoring her and I'm looking around, How's that gonna make her feel? What do you observe about her sharing, okay? So for ignoring and pretending, you're gonna get one minute to talk about anything you want, doesn't matter. And then I want you to go into selective listening and ask questions, engage in conversation, but as you would if you were selective listening, order taking ready to butt in with your thoughts, okay? So the speaker can talk about whatever they want 
and the listener is going to selectively listen and engage. Two minutes, and I'll put this on the boards. And then you're gonna do the same for attentive listening. One person's gonna talk for two minutes and the other person's gonna have an engaging back and forth as if we're best friends. And then the last one, see if you can, in two minutes, get into an empathic connection. By this time, you'll have been with the folks for a few minutes, 10. And so just try to get there and connect with the person. It's a short snippet, but it'll give you an opportunity to feel how these listening modes impact not only the listener, but also the person that should be listened to and how it impacts the people who are observing. I look forward to hearing. All right, I hope you guys had fun with that. I know you didn't get through everything because we didn't get through everything. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. How did I do, Polly? <laughs> you did great. You did great. I'm, I am pretty sure poor Sean wants to throw things at you. <laughs> it was getting, if you want to talk about it, it was getting irritating. <laughs> yeah. It or Jamie, good. come on. You did a good job. <laughs> Angie, sounds like you know him. <laughs> I don't think so. Me? Yeah. I know Jamie. I worked with Jamie, too, at the, about the yeah. same time as Polly. It was great. That's right. That's right. Exactly. All right. So we did get through ignoring, pretending, and stage one listening, that selective listening. And uh, it looks like we were right on path with everybody else. So I'd just like to know... Um, what were some of your observations, just high level? What were some of your observations? Um, this is Chad, I can speak for my group. I'm not sure if we have a team number or anything, but um, Nay was our speaker and Angela was our listener. Um, they both did a great job. We made it through you know, all five listening types and Angela was very good at kind of owning into that. And I think the whole room could feel um, the lack of feedback that Angela was providing at the beginning, which um, Nay clearly demonstrated her frustrations around that, right? And uh, at the end, when she was being empathic, you know, Nay was opening up and it was a much easier conversation to get information out of. Nice. That's awesome. Well done, you guys. Very cool. Who else has something to share? I want to actually share something about Polly's observations. We we made some observations about like when people ignored and we talked about, you know, they were expressionless and looked at, like they're disinterested and everything. But Polly took it a step further and she asked the speaker, how, how did that um, show of ignorance, you know, make you feel? And so we also talked not only about what the, what the listener was doing, but we also talked about what the speaker was feeling. And that was also a very powerful exercise. Nice, cool. Very cool. Anything else anyone wants to share? Well, well, in my group, we did the we we did do the attentive one, and I was um, just kind of relating a an issue that I have with this uh, museum I belong to, and so I was getting active feedback from people and giving me ideas. So. So that way too, you feel like um, that it, it's a more balanced mm. and because I know I've been on some conversations where it has been one-sided, you know what? I think sometimes some people really like to listen to them talk. <laughs> so when you have more of a interaction with people, then you, you feel listened to. Yes. Because, yes, because they're new ideas on um, how to resolve issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great call out. We had a great group, yeah. Nice. I have a One question. Thing that... mm -hmm. What's that? Jamie, then Vladimir. Oh. Um, so I, I, I think some of it is um, how the person uh, 
deals with the energy in the room. So some people feed off that energy, right? And then helps them actually be more verbal or excited about the topic while others could care less, you know, and they don't feed off the energy of the room, right? They, maybe they bring their own energy or they're just passionate about it. And so I think that, that so, you know, that a good example was myself when I was doing, you know, I lost energy as I was going because I need that energy, which Gary in our group, uh, he could have cared less. You know, he could have been talking to the dogs and, and it would have been a okay with him. <laughs> yeah, it was good. That's a great call out. Vladimir, what would you like to share? I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have noticed that during the exercise, when you went from um, selective listening to empathic, empathic listening, there were more sharing of information on the listener side. Mm. And at the same time, I still felt like the speaker was telling about something important and the listener uh, were, was kind of leading the, the, the speaker to another area of conversation. So who could actually explain what this empathic, um, how, how empathic listening is different or similar to sharing and uh, finding similarities with the other side? Mm. So empathic listening is really connecting with the person and, and being there. And it's almost like, um, I'll say you and I are, are having a conversation and you share something and then I may just like a, a question pops in my head and I just go with it. And it opens up a whole nother avenue of conversation that we might not have been able to explore if we just stayed right here and in the moment type of thing. Or it's really being able to go with the flow instead of necessarily following everything exactly, because you're just, you wanna be there in the moment and, and take it to that next level. And, and you kind of ebb and flow with that empathic. You don't necessarily stay there all the time. It's something you feel a shift. It's hard to explain. I, I think that the Beck's example I can think of, especially, you know, for those that have been married or in long-term relationships, when you, if you remember back to when you first met that person and what that felt like, and when you guys were talking and almost felt like you were so connected that you could almost you know hear what they were thinking right mm -hmm. uh and i'll say 10 years later my husband and i still have that where we actually will say the same things at the same time because we're so connected and that yeah you're right and that's kind of when you have those conversations it's it's that empathic connection it's that unconscious connection type of thing yeah, I didn't mean oh. to say that it disappears, but <laughs> but it I can, yeah. right? It can. I can, <laughs> but yeah, no, well, that, that's true. It can. It's just I remember, like in that in that very yeah. first moment when things are exciting, right? You that you have that excitement about that because you're so excited, like, hey, I found somebody to connect with. Yep, exactly. Good stuff. All right, we have 15 minutes left, and what that means is we're not going to do the exercise but I'm gonna take you through the material, okay? Because it's about asking powerful questions and I wanna connect the three before we part ways. Is that okay with you guys? Yes. You can practice on the board if you want later, but all right. Powerful questions tie it all together. So if you think about it, we're getting in touch with our emotional intelligence. We're focused on, um, understanding ourselves, self-awareness, what are our triggers, bringing things together, and then improving how we engage with the people and, and situations around us, okay? So we do that, we're gonna improve our listening, we understand the various listening styles, and now you'll start to notice, ooh, was I really paying attention? 
oh, I was really not, I, I was ignoring them. I, that, I make, that makes me feel sad. So I go and talk to them afterwards and say, I'm so sorry. I was focused on this. I should have been open with you, but I didn't want to hurt your feelings. And that was even worse. So we'll start to have those awarenesses. Powerful questions. So it's important that we learn how to ask questions more. One of the things that was mentioned in the beginning was fear. Fear holds us back and fear creates miscommunication. And a lot of times, I just had this today where I was on, the call, on a call with one of my team members and I said, that is such a great awareness. Can you bring that forward to the team? No. Okay. What would prevent you from bringing it forward? I'm the new kid. I can't stand out. But it's a brilliant observation. It would help the entire team. I will tell my manager so she can share. Oh, sweetheart. So we had a conversation around this and she's not willing to bring it to the whole team. However, she is willing to build some stuff out and then show them what she did to help them come to the agreement she's hoping to. And so it's baby steps and allowing people through powerful conversations and reflection to help them get there. So you all know Less powerful questions are things that you can answer with yes or no or a one word. Okay, so which one um, is there? Things like that. You want to start moving up this ladder, and I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve why, and we'll talk about that one. But when you start with things like where, who, when, what, how, they're more than one word, and they allow reflection and people will start to really dig into what's really going on here and go to the next level. Or they may reveal a nugget that allows you to then go down another path to learn more. So as you're sitting in a room with your teams, thinking about, I think I know, how can you validate your understanding? What questions can you ask that allow greater shared in, shared understanding, greater information for the whole team, making sure that, and, and you can ask as many questions as you want. We don't know them all, but as you start to move forward, if you come across something that you're not sure, ask, get feedback, validate. Why is a question that often is, it, it might put people on the defensive, it, begs an answer. Why did you do that? You feel like, oh, I got to give that answer. Usually why is something you'd like to reserve for root cause problems. If you're coaching people, people aren't broken. So if we want to find out what happened with this technology, um, the 35 bridge when it went down a few years ago, long time ago now, actually, but when the bridge collapsed, and all of that destruction happened, they had to understand why, and they had to do root cause analysis, and they had to peel back the layers to understand each avenue. That's brilliant. When you have a, a failure in technology or equipment, something tangible like that. When you're asking why of a person, make sure that you're asking it in a way that doesn't put them on the, on the defensive, but rather allows them to open up. And the most powerful question is, what if? And what if allows you to go to that next level of imagining the possibilities? What if this? What if that? So and you go from there. Go ahead, Jamie. So Polly, the the why. So I, I correct me if I'm if I if this is not what you're saying. But so the why really is in like ask why, right? Or use that necessarily that term, right? But what you're trying to do is just gain some insight into, like you said, what the root cause analysis is. So don't don't necessarily be literal and be like a two year old and say why 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 exactly right? Right? that's right. where you're going to okay exactly because it causes people to shut down and want to give right. the right answer yeah mm -hmm. and I think um, as well like. Just for example, a kid break a glass of cup and you're like, why? 
they're gonna give you one thousand reasons why they did that. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. More of, yeah, but it's more of defensive because they want to protect themselves. Maybe they think they're in trouble. Yeah. But in a situation whereby you said, what if, or maybe use another term that people will feel more open to share and knowing at the back of their mind they're not in trouble. That is yeah. right. Yeah. Like, oh, like what but, happened instead exactly. of why? Like, oh, oh heavenly, what happened? What happened? What happened? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Val. I just wanted to say I experienced the what if today. And this is a, yeah, this is a group that we're, it's a group of coaches that we work well together and that we just changed how we interact and how we want to have our purpose. But um, the, the coach who formed the group came and said, what if you had a genie lamp and you could rub it and you could change anything you wanted. And it started off, we, he, he said, only do one. I said, can we have two? And then we just went around and around and around. And it was very powerful. Very cool. Awesome. I love it. Sanjay. Yeah, I was, uh, I was trained that with the why question, some people just get defensive right away. Like, why did your velocity drop in half this sprint? Those kinds of things. And you're like, Holy smokes. Mm -hmm. So I was trained that instead of using why prefix it with help me understand, because what you're really going in is not to accuse people. You're going in to understand, say, hey, I'm here to help. Uh, I noticed that the metrics drop. Help me to understand what we can do to help the team. Yes. Love it. Love so, it. Sanjay, we can generalize this approach uh, because what you actually do is you create a a gap between yourself and the person who you speak to with the favor of the other person. So you essentially put yourself a little bit lower, you say, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you can, uh, in general, you can apply this approach in different ways. For example, I can, I can say, uh, you, you, you are expert in this uh, field and you know so much about this, uh, why such and such? So from this perspective, it's perceived as a respectful question. Yeah. So whenever you actually, I, I like your comment because you say you prefix something. So in many cases, we can ask many different things if we actually prepare the ground and we actually project the respect up front. Great. Great comment. Great call up, Vladimir. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the things as an agile coach that I remind my teams to do and that I have to remember is ask more questions to get greater understanding. And I think that if we all learn to improve our self-control, our self-awareness, continuously reflecting on how can I do better, listen, be curious, listen to learn, listen to understand, and then ask more questions to gain more information. That little combination, tiny little things that we can tweak make huge differences in our lives in general. So now you're gonna, you can't unthink this stuff. You're gonna start to notice it. I planted a seed and I look forward to see how they grow. Any other questions or thoughts anyone has to share? Actually, would you just mind repeating those last three pointers you gave? You said something, something, and then I ask more questions. It's on the recording. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> and the recording will be available. It really will on our LinkedIn channel. So, um, you know, just, just look for... Um, our Minnesota Agile community on LinkedIn, and we will um, accept your request to join. And the the videos will be there, as along with you know other other things like um, decks from previous events that we've had. So that, you made me think of one as we were talking about um, why another word that I think trips up people sometimes is but because that it's almost like you you know said. I love coffee. And then the next person comes like, oh yeah, coffee's great, but 
you know, chocolate is better or something like that. So it all of a sudden negates or makes it feel like that what that person said is less than than what's coming for or, or you know so be careful with that anything before the butt doesn't matter is how right. i've heard it right now right. i will share one of my biggest challenges a lot of people have replaced butt with and <laughs> mm -hmm. and, so pay, mm -hmm. they say, and, and and so i just caution that when you're using but or and, it's not because you want to get, so be aware, right? It's, there's positives around it all. It's just when people take things to extremes that we come into these challenges. And now you have that awareness. Yeah. I love it. I love it too. It's so awesome, Polly. Thank you everyone for 